Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming through. It's great to be here in Brussels for Spark Summit. My name is Nick Pentreath, and uh, today I'll be talking about scaling factorization machines on Apache Spark with parameter servers. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, ML Nick on Twitter. I'm a principal engineer working at IBM's Spark Technology Center, working on machine learning in Apache Spark, and uh, a member of the Apache Spark Project Management Committee, and finally author of Machine Learning with Spark. A little bit out of date uh, at the moment, but the uh, second edition will hopefully be coming out fairly soon. So today I'll start with a brief introduction to factorization machines, uh, then move on to how to train distributed FMs using Spark and the Glint parameter server framework, and then talk about uh, the results and of performance testing, uh, and finally the challenges that, that I faced uh, during some of this work and some directions for future exploration. The factorization machines are a fairly recent class of model uh, introduced around 2012 that have become popular in uh, domains with large, uh, large cardinality categorical features and in particular uh, data sets that, uh, that have a lot of uh, feature interactions or where feature, feature interactions are important. Examples of this uh, include recommender systems, online advertising, social networks, and, and, and this is where factorization machines have been successful. So in these domains, we have, a, for example, a set of users, uh, and they're interacting with our, with our website, uh, and uh, they, th they're viewing uh, content, they're issuing uh, search queries, they're watching movies or rating movies, they're following other users in our social network. All of these are user events, feature interactions, um, and inter uh, interactions between the users and some other entity in our system. We can represent these as, uh, as categorical IDs, the user and movie IDs, for example, in uh, movie ratings. And we, if we represent the data in this, in this uh, uh, feature representation, we can set up a model where we want to, let's say, predict movie ratings uh, using these features, uh, the features being the uh, user ID and the movie ID. So if we apply a linear model to this, we find that it's, it's just not expressive enough. Essentially, uh, we can only just capture the bias terms, uh, or in other words, the average rating for each user and movie ID. Uh, so we're not capturing the, the, uh, the affinity for a user and a movie, the interaction terms. If we try to model this directly using polynomial regression, we add an explicit feature interaction term for each user and movie combination. The problem here is that we've, we move into a, a, a a space and time complexity for our problem of uh, order d squared. Uh, now d here in, this, uh, in these domains can be extremely large. We're talking uh, tens or hundreds of millions of, of users on the web, uh, movies, products, ad, uh, ad, ads, or other users in a social network. So this is clearly not feasible. Uh, in addition, the polynomial regression uh, model can actually not uh, generalize to unseen feature interactions. So the factorization machine tries to combine the flexibility uh, of linear models and the polynomial regression approach and the ability to handle uh, multiple types of features with the success of factorization, uh, matrix factorization techniques for recommender systems. So instead of having an explicit factorization, uh, sorry, feature interaction term, we create a factorized interaction term. Now we've reduced our problem uh, to from order d squared in terms of uh, space complexity to one of order dk where d is, our, our again, our feature dimension, and k is the, uh, the dimension of this, this factorized uh, low-dimensional representation. However, if we try to solve this naively, we end up in a order d squared k uh, uh, computational complexity problem. Fortunately for us, we can apply a, a bit of a math hack and reformulate the formula so that we can solve this in order dk. So now we've got a, a, a very powerful model uh, that, that can model uh, complex interactions, and we've, we've got a, a, an efficient way uh, to solve this. It's no longer convex like a linear model, but we can still train it using stochastic gradient descent, uh, block coordinate descent, or alternating least squares type of approaches, or uh, Bayesian sampling approaches. So factorization machines, uh, why would we use them over something like uh, standard matrix factorization? Well, they're actually more general than that. So if, if, we, uh, if we use our features as the, the user IDs and movie IDs, for example, in our movie rating, then that is exactly the same as standard matrix factorization with biases. 
But in addition to that, we can include any arbitrary features that we want, whether categorical or real valued. So for example, we could include categories and tags of our movies, uh, contextual data like the device type, uh, time of day, geolocation, uh, when, a when a user is viewing a web page or watching a movie. Uh, and in addition, real valued features, for example, price trends in e-commerce. So it's a very flexible model and uh, if you feature engineering, we can effectively mimic almost any standard matrix factorization model. So they're very powerful. However, we are still left with uh, a scaling problem. So even in a moderately sized problem, we might have tens, hundreds of millions of uh, dimensions because we have many, many users in a moderate sized social network, uh, online advertising, many, many ads, many advertisers. Uh, and we, wa we would like to have a, mod a fairly large uh, low dimensional representation, so that the, the, the K, the, the dimension of our factors, uh, we want that to be in the tens to, to hundreds in order to, to accurately capture the feature interaction uh, information. So this model can very quickly become large. So with 100 million dimensions, a 60K of 64, for example, we have a 50 gigabyte model. So it's within the realms of large servers, but we might have hundreds of millions to even billions of training examples. So we want to train this in a distributed manner. The standard way of uh, training l models on Spark is what's known as data parallel. So we split up the data set into partitions uh, and, and the master node is responsible for distributing the uh, initial model to all the workers through a broadcast. Each worker then computes the, the gradient based on the current model. Now this is a partial gradient based on the data that it sees, but in the, the, the default Spark implementation, it uses the full model to compute. And then once those gradients are computed on each worker, the master then receives them all back through a tree aggregation and a collect operation. Now this is clearly a, a bottleneck because the master has to be involved in every single iteration and the entire model has to be broadcast and reduced back. So while Spark has a, a fairly efficient tree aggregation mechanism, this master is still the bottleneck. One approach to solving this problem is, data, is model and data parallel. Uh, and parameter servers is, is, is one way of doing this. So the key observation here is that, especially for this, this type of uh, uh, problem domain, recommender systems, online advertising, the data sets are extremely sparse. So within a given partition, only a few percent of the, the features are actually active. So each worker doesn't need the entire model to compute the gradients. So whereas before we were computing partial gradients using the full model, with parameter servers, the, each worker can compute the partial gradient using only the portion of the model that it needs. So it only needs to pull that model from the parameter server, which is, is itself distributed. And then once it's computed the gradient and the update, it can push the, mo uh, the partial model back. And then once, you know, at the end, we, can we have a, a full model. So th there are a couple of distributed uh, factorization machine implementations out there. One of them is uh, Spark-LibFM, which uses the, the old gradient descent um, mechanisms of uh, MLlib. So it, it hasn't been updated to the new Spark ML pipelines and 2.0. Um, and it uses the, this linear model approach here, broadcast and reduce. De facto is a seminal paper uh, for distributed factorization machines, and that's a custom implementation using uh, the parameter server, PS Lite. It's, it's coded in C++ uh, with a lot of extra features, adaptive gradient descent, L1 regularization, frequency adaptive uh, regularization based on, on feature occurrence, and many other uh, tricks uh, to, to speed things up. So th that is the, uh, one of the, the bases for my work and in the inspiration for that. So Glint FM. Uh, I won't talk too much about Glint itself. It's, it's an uh, asynchronous parameter server framework developed on top of Acker. Rolf, who's, who's actually here, is, is giving a talk on, on that uh, later, later today. I think it's quarter past five in the silver, yeah, silver Hall, so please go and see that. He's the author of Glint. So I won't talk much about the parameter server imp implementation itself, but more how we go about training the factorization machine model using Glint. So on the right, we have a, a simplified code snippet uh, for the way that, that it works. But the, the basic idea is that uh, Glint provides a 
distributed vector and matrix API. So you can create a, a vector or a matrix that is transparently distributed across the parameter servers and uh, push and pull pieces of that matrix or vector to your workers. So first we create the parameters. One is, is a uh, weight, uh, a, a simple vector, weight vector coefficient with dimension D. And the other is our factor matrix. So it has dimension D and K. Then for each partition of the data, instead of uh, doing a, a map operation uh, like we might do in, in the normal uh, uh, Spark impl implementation, we're going to use for each partition, because for in each partition we're going to run multiple iterations. So the first thing we, we need to do is we can pre-compute which features are active in this partition. Um, and that means that we do that once, we pay that cost once up front, and we know which features are going to be needed for this uh, portion of the model. Once we've and, and that is the, the local keys. Once we've done that, then we proceed to iterate. The start of each iteration, the worker pulls the latest model for the subset of the, mo the model using uh, for those keys uh, from the parameter servers. It then uses that model to compute the, the gradient, which is a fairly simple, relatively simple comp computation. And then finally, computes an update and pushes the results. So the, the pulling of the, mo of the partial model is a blocking operation. I mean, it, it's implemented as asynchronous, but you need to block and wait until you, uh, until you, you actually receive that model before you can do any computation. Um, the, and the final push can be fully async. In my implementation, I, I actually made it blocking just to measure times um, and speed ups, but it can be done uh, fully asynchronously. So for the, for the performance comparison, I used a, a, a commonly known uh, display advertising data set from the Criteo uh, Kaggle competition. So it's, it's fairly large in, in, in terms of number of examples, but what's more interesting is it has uh, 34 million unique features and it's highly sparse. So approximately 48 non-zero uh, entries in, in each example. So extremely sparse data set. And we can see that it follows a, a, a power law-like distribution, which is common of this sort of data. So a few of the features make up the overwhelming majority of the, of the overall cardinality or dimension. And we, we see that we have a small number of features which occur very often, but after that it tails off extremely quickly. So on average per partition, using for in this case I was using 48 partitions, you have a, something like four or five percent of the features are active. Uh, so you only need to effectively communicate four or five percent of the model. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, feature extraction for this data set, um, and it, that has its own uh, complexities. So we start off with a, with a bunch of categorical features in our, in, a, in, a, you know, in our data frame, and we'd like to extract vectors. So the first thing you'd want to do is just apply uh, Spark ML string indexer, then one hot, one hot encode each categorical variable. So this, this works, or it should work, but I hit an out of memory error just because the, the feature size is so large. So that, that's an area for investigation. So how do we get around that? Well, one way was what I call stringify. So because these are categorical uh, features, we can represent the, the occurrence of a feature. You know, uh, in, in that example, i1 is, is 1 or uh, i4 is 0 uh, as, as a string that, that has the feature name equal to a value. And, and that's a binary indicator. And after that, we can apply a count vectorizer, which will give us the result we need. So now I've gone from my raw data to uh, what I need, which is effectively binary and or one hot encoded, the equivalent of one hot encoded categorical features. This works for feature hashing too. Um, I won't talk too much about this right now, but I'll come back to that later. Okay, so onto the real meat of, uh, of the results. So here I, I took the data set and uh, I varied the, the, the level of K, which is the size of the factor, uh, the factorization or low dimensional representation. So we can see that we get a, uh, up to a three to five times speed up for the model that Spark, can, Spark itself can actually handle. But I very quickly hit this two gigabyte limit on broadcast variables. So trying to broadcast a model larger than K equals about seven uh, or K equals six. Uh, hits this limit. But I, I was successful in scaling up uh, the, the Clint based uh, implementation up to k equals 32. Um, I didn't actually have time to, to work on a larger data set, but uh, it, you, know, you can see that it scales not quite linearly, but 
uh, but more or less. So if we delve a little bit more deeply into where this performance difference is coming from, we can see that there's two stages to each iteration with the, the MLlib, the, the sort of standard Spark approach. The first stage is the gradient computation on all the workers using the, the, the partial model, or the, the partial gradient using the full model. So at first glance, it looks like there's a little bit of uh, task deserialization time and quite a lot of compute time. But if you delve into this, the vast majority of that compute time is actually taken up in reading the broadcast variable. So for some reason, that's not actually included in the task uh, serialization, deserialization time, but it is actually uh, measured. I, I actually did measure that. So only a very small portion is, is compute and the rest there is communication. And then once those gradients are computed, then they're aggregated and summed together and then sent back to the, the master. So we can see that, th again, th the large majority of the time spent in the second phase, which is this aggregation phase, is the get result time, which is the time that it takes to ship the result back to the master. So not surprisingly then, we see that there's a massive difference in the amount of communication that is going on. So the, the MLLibFM and the GlintFM uh, models or, or implementations are doing roughly the same amount of computation because they've got to compute the same gradient in the same way, more or less. Uh, but obviously, uh, the, the Glint uh, parameter server approach is doing vastly less communication. So trying to implement this uh, is not without its, its challenges. Glint is a fantastic project, but uh, I'm sure Rolf will agree it's, it's, uh, it, it's still young and, and still uh, developing. Um, so some of, the, some of the issues that I ran into uh, were how to tune, uh, both on the Glint side and the Spark side. You know, Glint, uh, how much parallelism to, to have in the, in the models, how many models per server, how much to split it up. Uh, tuning message sizes, ACA configurations, and on Spark, uh, data partitioning, um, which effectively for, for this gradient descent approach can be seen as a sort of mini batch size. You know, So how many partitions uh, should, should we have? Glint, uh, again, being, being a young project, doesn't yet support user-defined functions on the, on the parameter server side, which makes it very difficult to implement certain features from de facto, for example, L1 regularization, adaptive sparsity, adaptive gradient descent. So these, these definitely result in better performance, both of the, the model performance on, on from a data perspective, but also uh, for communication, fast execution, and so on, uh, because it reduces the model size over time as, uh, as the solution becomes sparser and, and therefore less communication. And then finally, there's no built-in back pressure or current concurrency control within the Glint framework, so uh, that has to be tuned manually, and it's quite easy to overwhelm your parameter servers by sending them uh, too much data at, uh, at once or to having too many concurrent requests open. So one example of this tuning models per server, uh, I, I took a look at changing that, uh, that number and seeing what the, what the impact is. So uh, perhaps not too surprising that if we have too little parallelism, uh, then our, our runtime goes up. But as we increase it, it actually doesn't, it tends not to help much. So there's sort of a sweet spot in the middle where, uh, and I found that it, if, you, if you match uh, the, the number of partitions roughly to the number of models per server or in total, so total number of parameter server partitions, that's m you know, not always, but more or less where your sweet spot is. So previously I alluded to feature hashing and why would we want to do that? Well, one thing I found with the initial implementation using the, the count vectorizer and this uh, can be an issue for the, the way that one-hot encoding works in Spark 2, is that because features are, are then sorted by a feature occurrence, effectively, then you end up with uh, your feature vector sorted in, in, in order of uh, the number of times that that, that that feature occurs. And because of the way that, the, the, that Glint splits up the parameters across parameter servers uh, using a... Uh, a range, uh, effectively a, a range uh, partitioner, you end up with one or two uh, parameter shards that are parameter server shards that are the hot features and they're getting hit all the time uh, with updates. So to do that, uh, to solve that problem, I spread out the features using feature hashing. Um, so it, it's effectively the same as, a, as the count vectorizer, uh, but it, it, uh, it'll hash the, 
the feature, the, the string representation of the feature to find the index in the feature vector. And that was very successful in spreading out the features and avoiding this, this hot, uh, hot feature problem. So we can see that there's, there's a sort of 25% um, performance improvement from that. So some of the, the future work uh, that would be uh, trying to add en enhance enhancements to, to Glint uh, from, from the de facto paper. So for example, uh, user-defined functions on the parameter server side to allow L1 regularization, adaptive gradient descent, uh, and so on. Looking into built-in back pressure. So for example, uh, ACA, the most recent version of ACA in master has, has upgraded the remoting um, the, the, the remoting um, communication module to use uh, Aeron, which is a much faster communication protocol, which itself will, will no doubt uh, provide some fairly, fairly large performance benefits. But it could be interesting to look into using um, something like ACA Streams or, or some sort of other reactive model to see if, uh, if back pressure can be built into this framework. Uh, and similarly, UDFs themselves is an interesting challenge. You know, how to implement that on the parameter server side? Again, th th that might be uh, done via sort of streams or a, a composition of actors, where you you can define your U your UDF as a as a stream stream phase, or an operation in the, in that stream graph, or, or itself an actor that can be at runtime dynamically plugged into uh, to the data flow to, for example perform linear algebra operations on, this on the parameter server that is required for L1 regularization. Uh, and then finally, and, and th this would be a, a, a fairly straightforward and actually a very big win, is, is caching the keys. So in, in this particular case, um, and it's common in, 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 in many uh, problems, we can pre-compute exactly which uh, feature indexes we need, indices we need uh, per partition. So once we've done that, uh, we can, instead of each time sending to the parameter server, uh, I need to pull this set of keys and I need to push for this set of keys or this set of indices, that can be cached and effectively something like a, you know, a, a hash of the keys or, or some representation of the keys that is much smaller can be sent to the, to the parameter server so it knows to send back uh, the right data, but it, uh, you don't need to communicate those messages. So that, that would be about a 2x two, two decrease in message size, which will help a lot. And then finally, uh, more more on the uh, model or algorithm side, looking at uh, using mini-batch stochastic gradient descent within each partition uh, for better convergence or better control of, uh, uh, of the model, and looking at uh, distributing the solvers, the, the, the other solvers. I mean, SGD is, uh, is very simple to implement, but uh, as you might know, it's the, the, there are a lot of gotchas, a lot of parameters to tune. Um, Adagrad works very well to, to help with that, but um, Things like uh, Bay Bayesian sampling, MCMC, or coordinate descent methods tend to uh, require a lot less uh, tuning um, and they have fewer hyperparameters. Hyper so finding ways to, to distribute that within the parameter server or, or model parallel framework could, uh, could provide large gains. And then finally, something quite interesting, the, uh, one of the, the people who introduced factorization machines, Stefan Rendel, has got a paper around uh, block structure or relational data formulation for, for these models. So in many cases you have a uh, whole bunch of users and items or ads or movies and a lot of metadata around them that is effectively repeated in your, in your feature vector representation. So there are ways to represent those as, as, as a sort of relational structures or block structures where you can compress all of that information down significantly and therefore uh, scale to much larger sizes. So finally, th there's a few references. I mean, the slides will be available, uh, so there's a few references out there. Um, and I'd just like to say thanks very much to uh, uh, to Rufeng Zeng, who created the Sparklib FM implementation, which I used as a baseline, and uh, and to check correctness and and reuse the, some of the components there, and to Rolf for the uh, the Glint parameter server framework. So on to questions. Oh, and so finally, everything is up there on GitHub uh, over there. So it's still very rough and uh, you know, purely experimental, uh, but uh, it's all there for you to check out if you're interested. All right. Uh, do we have any questions? 
First of all, is this presentation going to be available later? Uh, yes, the, uh, typically the, the summit will post them all on the slide share, okay. and I will also personally post it on, okay. on so the slide share. Uh, I have a question. It's not specific to factor factorization machines. I don't. I don't. Um, I'm not aware of how uh, Spark trains um, even simple models like linear regression or logistic regression. I mean, is this um, just an online algorithm? And each worker uh, computes a mini batch on uh, on each local data and then sends the gradi gradients back to the, to the master node. Is it something like that? And is this also the pattern that you followed for this uh, implementation? Uh, y yes, so the, the, way th the way that Spark will currently uh, solve models like logistic regression or, or linear models is, is exactly that. Uh, it'll compute gradients on, on the workers and then send those gradients back to the master and then on the master the update is performed. So th the update will be is, you know, essentially adding the, the gradient to the previous weight vector, applying regularization. Uh, the, the latest version of Spark uh, 2.0 and the Spark ML pipeline API, which is the recommended way of, of, of doing things currently in Spark ML, uses a more efficient uh, mechanism overall. So it, it, it does the same thing, uh, but it uses um, LBFGS to, uh, to optimize. So in fact, you, you end up uh, often having a longer runtime with, with that approach uh, because the, the it's a little bit more complex and it tends to do a bit more work, but you end up with better accuracy. So th there's a kind of trade-off there. I didn't show the, the results for that here, but I did actually test against um, the logistic regression implementation against Spark ML, and that's what I found. Quite a bit longer runtime in some cases, in, or in all cases, um, sometimes by a wide margin, but tended to be more accurate for the same amount of iterations. All right, do we have any other questions? Over there. Hi, thank, thank you for the great presentation. I have a question. I, I, I don't know if you consider in the future work uh, adding the online feature. So the fact that you don't, have to, you don't want to recompute, let's say you have uh, one, one day of extra data that you don't have to recompute the complete metrics. I don't know if you, you're planning to do something like that. Uh, so, so if I understand the, the question correctly, it's, it's looking at um, doing things purely online and, uh, and, and Recomputing or updating the model as new data comes in, for example, in streaming. Or so, the beauty of stochastic gradient descent versus you know a batch algorithm like LBFGS, for example, is that you can do exactly that. Um, I didn't investigate it, but the the core of sort of underlying uh, algorithm is such that you can take the, the the model that you've trained on, let's say, 30 days of data, and then every day just feed in the day of data, the new day of data. So uh, you know, as, as long as it's um, as long as you have the you know you save the previous model, you can do that. Anybody else? All right, let's give one more round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.